actually going to be looking at the whole of Titus 2, so I'll just finish off the, uh, the rest of the chapter. Verse 9, Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you tell us to not be hearers only of the word but also doers of the word. So we ask that you would help us this morning, help us to focus and to concentrate, and then to go and do. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What would you like to be remembered for? We're all going to be remembered for something. You don't have to be famous, your friends, the people you're sat with will all remember you for doing something perhaps or for being someone. I wonder what that will be. Perhaps they'll remember you for your looks or your humour or your concern for other people or your sporting achievements perhaps or your business acumen or that you kept a nice garden or you were good at baking what would you like to be remembered for? There are lots of things, aren't there? And no doubt many of them are very vain and they will soon be forgotten. But then there are other things which last, which people generations from now will be thankful for. And it's those things that we should be interested in, isn't it? Because they are the things that will last. Well, we're thinking about the ministry of aging today. We're continuing our series uh, in aging. And my aim today is that you would leave here longing to be remembered for the things that last, that you would put your effort from now on into investing into things which will go on and have worth long after you have gone. And we're going to be using Titus 2, so do reopen your Bibles if you happen to have closed them. We're on page 1198. And the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter to Titus to give him some instructions about how to organize the churches on the island of Crete. And in chapter 2, his focus is on teaching. Just in this short chapter, 14 verses, teaching is mentioned 11 times. And the goal of all teaching is godliness. And Titus has these instructions. They're not uh, exhaustive in their content, but they're for various groups in the church. And we're going to look at some of those. And we're going to start with the older men and the older women. And this is our first point. Older people are to be godly people. Let's have a look at the older men first. Verse 2. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. It all sounds good, doesn't it? But it's not very exciting. In fact, I think society would tell us that if you were to put all of those characteristics together, you would end up with quite a dull and a boring person. But we shouldn't be so disparaging about these qualities. Rather, it would be helpful for us to look through them and to see just what these things mean. Older men are to be temperate. Now that means 
They are to show moderation and self-restraint, enough but not too much, not to be overindulgent. Older men are to be worthy of respect. The older man is honest in his business dealings. He has integrity. His speech is gracious. He does the right thing. Older men should be self-controlled. That means they're not at the mercy of their emotions. They don't just fly off the handle. They're, keep, they, they're able to keep their whole being in check. Their speech, the things their eyes look at, the things their minds think about, their temper. Older men are to be sound in faith. Sound means mature. They've learned to depend on God in all circumstances. They pray. And they're to be mature in love. They serve other people with patience out of love for the Lord. And they are to be sound in endurance. They keep going. They don't give up. And if you think those things are not worth pursuing, then it may be because you have forgotten a couple of things. And the first thing is perspective. I wonder, do you ever look back over your life and think, why did I spend so much time and effort and invest so much in that? And there's a sense of regret as you ask the question because you realize that there were far more important things you could have put your time and your energy and your money into. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, so the saying goes. Now let me give you an example of this. If we turn back a couple of pages, there's no need to, but if we did and we went to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8... Paul says, for physical exercise is of some value. And he's right, isn't it? Isn't he? You know, it's good to look after your body. But he goes on, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. We must not lose perspective and think that less important things, in that particular example, physical exercise, are in fact more important because they're not and that's easy to do and so in the same way godliness the world would say godliness isn't important you know spend yourself on things that are going to make you popular but it's a lie these things that we have in these opening verses are the things of real value and we need to have the right perspective the second thing to remember is this. God is making Christians to be like Jesus. There has never been a man who more perfectly uh, displayed these characteristics than Jesus. And he wasn't boring or cold or distant. People loved him. Children loved to be around Jesus. The rebels, the irreligious, loved to be around Jesus. If you uh, seek to grow in these things in the right way then you will end up like Jesus next Titus is to teach the older women verse 3 likewise teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine reverent in the way they live many of you would say I believe in God this, bo this verse here poses the question, do you live like there is a God? Do the things you do show a, a reverence towards God? We're not talking here about a, a fear of, of punishment because the Christian is free from all of that. But we're talking about a, an awe, a love uh, for your Father and all that he's done for you. In Jesus, Are you growing in an understanding of who he is, his goodness and his greatness and his, his love towards you? And does that leave you humbled? You know, we need to remember every breath we receive is a, is a gift from him. Because as we know God better, that's going to lead to a humility 
and as we reverence God more, ungodliness is going to be driven out of our, our lives. The more we revere God, the less room there is for ungodliness. And so there's two examples here. Older women should use the lips they have to build people up and to not build them, and to not pull them down, rather. Perhaps ask this question before you speak. Would I say this if the person I'm talking about was actually here? It's a good general question to ask. And older women, the verse goes on, shouldn't be mastered by alcohol. Now, there appears to be a problem in Crete, and it's certainly a problem that hasn't disappeared in this day and age. The more you revere God, the less you will be mastered by other things. And the point of all of these commands is this. Older people are to train younger people to be godly. I don't know if you noticed when the passage was read that Titus has uh, instructions for the older men and the older women and the younger men, but not for the younger women. And that's because that job is for the older women. Verse 4, then they can train the younger women. Now, of course, Paul does not mean here that the older men can just uh, sit back, not bother investing in those younger than them. Titus is to teach the younger men, and so are the older men, I think. And so what we have here for all older people is an opportunity to be remembered as somebody who invested in the lives of Christians so that they would grow up to be godly. And the application for each of us as we grow older is to never think or to say or give the impression to other people that you have no purpose here. Sometimes, you know, Bournemouth and places along the south coast are referred to as God's waiting room. And that might be how some of your friends, how some of your neighbours who do not know the Lord think and behave, but it's not for you. It's not true of you. You're not here to just wait around to die. You are essential, essential to the teaching and training of younger people in this church. God says you are in his word. And the commands we've just looked at, if you take them to heart and obey them, they will make you into the sort of older man, the sort of older woman capable of teaching the generation after you. That is the sort of legacy you should want to leave behind. That's the sort of thing you should want to be remembered for. Now, of course, as we talk about the uh, outworking of all of these commands, it would be very easy to look and to say, that's just not me. That's just not me. And to think, unless I can do these things perfectly, well, I'll never be suitable to teach the younger generation. Now that's not the point of these verses. If you're pursuing the characteristics in these verses, then you will be capable, you will be suitable to teach those younger than you. And so women who have, or who are pursuing the characteristics of verse three will be fit to do verses four and five. Let's have a look. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands. Some of these commands here are clearly for married women with children. And that isn't to say that unmarried women or women without children are in any way less than other women. But what Paul is doing here is making it clear that these women have a specific training need, shall we call it. For example, have a look. The command to love husbands and children seems a little odd, doesn't it? Of course they'll love 
their husbands and their children when things are going well. But even in the short time I've been married, I know that things are not always plain sailing. There'll be arguments and tension and friction. You know, perhaps the husband wants to lead his wife in one direction, but she's not so keen, but she wants to honor God in the marriage. What does she need? Well, she needs an older woman who can come along and encourage her and exhort her and perhaps even empathize with her because it's much easier to hold a grudge than it is to love. Or maybe you've got children and there's stress over their behavior or you know you just want them to be saved and they're not. Or you feel a bit guilty about your own parenting. You know, maybe an older woman could come and help and listen. Women are to be busy at home. If ever there was a command that was bound to cause confusion nowadays, uh, it's probably this one, isn't it? If a woman gets married and has children, then the home may well be the place where she spends most of her time. But there are financial needs, aren't there? There needs to be food on the table And that may well require uh, the mother to work outside the home. This verse is not a a prohibition against women working outside the room, outside the home. In fact, the phrase busy at home, I think the emphasis here falls more on the busyness than being at home. Because back in chapter 1, verse 12, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. For women to be busy is a way of them demonstrating the transforming power of the gospel. The other teachings to be self-controlled, pure and kind are also in conflict with what society would tell you. Therefore, older women, do you see that how, how high the stakes are in this? Because if you don't teach the younger women these things, no one outside in the world is going to teach them you have a great responsibility and of course the the younger women could pick up a bible they could read what they ought to be like but what God desires is a visual picture for these women so that they can look and they can say hey I want to be like her or the men can say I want to be like him because you set such a good example So be the kind of people who can train others. Men, let me give you an example uh, to encourage you. I have some older Christian friends. They're called Sean and Anna. And a few years ago, I went to, to stay with them. And one evening, Sean and I were watching a film. And there was a scene in this film that started, and it wasn't good. It wasn't appropriate. And Sean turned to me and he said, this isn't good. My wife Anna wouldn't want me to watch this. And he just turned it off. And I'll never forget that he did that. Whether he meant to teach me something or not, I don't know. But I thought in that moment, he showed me something about godliness, about what it's right to watch and what it's not so good to watch. He was showing himself, like verse 2 says, as being worthy of of respect I think our lives um, are like jigsaws they're made up of many little pieces many little uh, decisions that we make every day the things we say the things that we do they form a, a picture don't they if you add all of those things together you get a picture and what we should be aiming at is a picture of godliness. And so older women, older men, live lives that younger people will look at and say, I want to be like that person. Well, how should all of this happen? Two things. It should happen as we spend time together in normal life. When I was watching the film with Sean, we were just doing something normal and the opportunity came up for him to teach me. And he did. 
just in the normal course of life, spontaneous. But opportunities might arise as you have a meal with someone or a cup of tea with them or if you help someone with their children. But also teaching might arise if it's done in a more planned and structured and regular way. For example, if you know a a younger person, you might discover, you know, they've got a big decision to make or they're really struggling. And you as an older person could go to them and say, what we need to do here is sit down and see what God says about this. Come and meet me this week. We'll spend an hour together. We'll read the scriptures. We'll pray. Let me teach you. Let me train you. So it can happen both spontaneously and in a planned way. Well, what is the basis of all of this? There are several motivations in this passage for why we should do what Paul is telling Titus to teach here. But I want us to look at verse 11. We don't have time for all of the motivations. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men As I read that verse this week, and I read the verses after it, I just thought, that is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Because sometimes we can think, well, of course God would show me grace. It's his job. I may be in trouble, but he, you know, he's obligated uh, to come and save me, to promise a savior. Well, God would have done no wrong if he'd not sent us a savior. If he'd just left us to run our course and face judgment. But here, God has shown us grace. We deserve nothing from him. And this grace looks like this. Have a look at the end of verse 13 and 14. Jesus Christ, who is our great God and Savior, gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. God loves you. God loves you. He gave himself for you. Jesus endured his father's wrath that should fall on me and fall on you. He took that for you. The cross, which we'll remember later when we have the bread and the the juice, is the most important event in the whole of history. And this is the great motivation. Because God's purpose in showing us grace is in the middle of verse 14, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. God has made you his own. You belong to God's family. And the sign that you belong to his family is at the end of verse 14, you are eager to do what is good. I don't know if you noticed when the the passage was read earlier that what the older women are to teach in verse 3 is described as being good. And in verse 7, what Titus is to do by setting an example is show what is good. So doing good is a sign that you belong to God. So are you eager? Are you eager to do good? Well, finally, what should be our response to this? Older people, if as you read these commands, you think, I'm so far away from being the older man, the older woman I'm supposed to be, I'll never be able to do this, then remember the motivation does not come from looking at yourself and thinking, I am a terrible person. What I need to do is go home and just try really hard to do the things in verses 2 and 3. No, we are to be taught by grace. And look at what grace teaches us. Verse 12. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. If you know you're not as you should be, and none of us are, then let grace be your teacher. And for the younger people, 
What should we be doing? Well, we should be watching. Older people are our example. They're what we ought to aim for as we get older. But we must be careful because there is a, a right way and there's a wrong way to watch. And the wrong way to watch is to look at an older person and to see all the mistakes they make and all the sins they commit and to think they could never teach me anything. That is like Jesus said, to attempt to deal with the speck in someone else's eye without taking the plank out of your own eye. That's not the right way to watch older people. The right way to watch is with sober realization that I am a sinner saved by Jesus and so are all the other Christians here and we want to be looking out for evidences of God's grace being at work in fellow Christians lives and we want to be encouraged by that and we want to think I need to copy that I'm being taught something here we've got a blueprint haven't we in verses 2 and 3 of what to look out for in men and women so let's look out for those things and be thankful when we see them. Secondly, as you see the older people who share the characteristics of verses 2 and 3, aim to get to know them. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers loss. You become like those you spend your time with. So acknowledge that there are things and situations you just don't know about. And that's going to require humility. But that's what you need if you're going to be taught. God has so arranged things that younger people will not be godly without older people. There is a wisdom, a godliness, which comes with years. And so younger people need to get to know older people. Thirdly, younger people are to be taught and trained in order that they might be able to do the same for others. Take the teaching of the older men and women to heart. Encourage them through your changing lives and aim to be equipped like they are in order that you might start to teach those who are younger than you. Well, let's conclude. What do you want to be remembered for? I hope you want to be remembered as a person who received God's grace in Jesus Christ, that you were changed by his grace into the kind of person he wants you to be. That you taught those younger than you and that you prayed that God would raise up godly men and women to follow you in the generations to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the very practical nature of it. We thank you that you don't come at us with a big stick telling us to pull our socks up, but that you show us grace through the Lord Jesus. We thank you for him. And we pray, Lord, that we may all have received that grace and go on receiving it, that we may be changed as your word tells us to be, that we may live lives which honor you, and that even after death, the kinds of people we were would be remembered and that you might be given thanks for who we were. Amen.